a ridiculous tale. The inaudible man, indeed. <laughs> Do you seriously ask me to believe that nonsense? We ask nothing of you, Mr. Green. It is you who are asking us to admit you to the Mausoleum Club. Then kindly do so at once, sir. I can tell a story as well as the rest of you. We've already told you it's not just a simple matter of storytelling. There's a second condition of membership. Oh, yes, well, what is the second? All in good time, Mr. Green. We need to decide whether you're suitable. Yeah. This is the most exclusive club in London. Yeah. Oh, exclusive? Then how is it that a scion of the aristocracy like myself is kept dithering on the threshold while a colonial oh. like you, sir, is oh. firmly installed? <laughs> well, sir, what better answer to that can I give than to tell you my... My story. A story of a journey into the very darkest heart of barbarism. Tales from the Mausoleum Club, written by Ian Brown and James Hendry, starring Matt Frewer, Jim Broadbent, Richard Pearson, Royce Mills, Sheila Stiefel, Bill Wallace, Ron Pember, and Michael Ripper. Episode 2, Heart of Skegness. My story begins many years ago when I was a young zealot in the Mormon mission to Europe. Oh, worse and worse. I was stationed in Brussels, and one sweltering day in June, I was summoned for an urgent meeting with my superior. Uh, come on in, Johnson. Oh, goddamn this heat. Sir, hmm? blasphemy. Oh, yeah. We've been praying for cooler weather, but I fear our new liturgy is suffering from low penetration. The Lord will provide, sir. Until that, the recruitment force. Huh? Have you seen the latest fall in our conversion rate? Good. Yes, Johnson. Golly, sir, what's gone wrong? Well, allow me to illuminate the problem with the uh, latest visual aid. What's that? The magic lantern. Well, now, do you, uh, do you recognize this photographic portrait? It's Curtis, mm. our medal-winning emissary mm. exhibited at uh, Frankfurt in Paris, I believe. Yes, uh, this slide was taken during his record-breaking native conversion drive. Three and a half hot and tots per minute. That fellow must have a whole parcel of charisma. And that is not all, Johnson. We have got $8,000 worth of training invested in that man. Which is a lot of money in these days. So we can't afford to lose him now. Lose him? We've been getting uh, disturbing rumors from Curtis's latest posting. He stopped sending dispatches in March. And our only news of him came with his monthly requests for Bibles. But even those have dried up. So what's going on? We do not know. Some reports talk of illness, others that he's gone astray. We simply do not know. I'm sending you out to find out what's happened. Of course, sir. I'm ready to go wherever you and the Lord send me. Right. Where is it? Africa? The Far East? The Caribbean? No, 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 no. Lincolnshire, England. Where? In a little village called Skagness, the... the uh, the, the furthest outpost of our English campaign. Oh, dash these flies. They're all God's creation. Well, this one's going back to its manufacturer. Ah, I got you, little critter. Right. We've uh, chartered a steamer out of Zeebrugge on Tuesday next. It's taking a fresh consignment of Bibles to Skagness. Be on it. Very good, sir. The skipper is Captain White, an old sea dog of many years standing. I expect he's a bit rough and ready, but... He'll see you through the worst of it. Worst of what? Oh, ah, oh, criminy. Oh, the, the magic lantern. No, uh -huh. quick. Ah, help me put it out. Oh, bring back engraving. As we hastened to douse the flames, the image of Curtis we had projected on the whited wall of that sepulchral room was gradually consumed by a fire hotter than any earthly furnace, and my heart was filled with dark forebodings of the days ahead. All right, all right. All the way, me hearties. Order! Are you sailors or schoolgirls? Uh, pardon me, sir. What is it, sir? Might you be Captain White by any chance? Might I? <laughs> this gentleman wants to know if I might be Captain White. <laughs> What's so funny? No, sir. I might not. You'll find him yonder. All right, lads. Uh, I, I want these crates on that boat. I don't care who does it as long as it's done by tea time, because we'll be gone by then. Oh, and 
and do it properly, else you'll put your backs out. Who I can just see it happen. Uh, pardon me, Captain White? Yes? I'm Mr. Johnson. Yes? From the Mormon mission. Oh, yes, there was a message. Uh, look, I, I won't shake hands. I've got this terrible blister. Been giving me heck all day. Uh, I haven't got a pin on you. Uh, no. Doctor says I'm to wear gloves when pulling ropes, but they'd rag me something rotten, this lot. <laughs> oh, um, uh, this is Mr. Bannister, the first mate. Well, hello, mate. And, uh, this is Mr. Welsh, our engineer. How do. Hello. He's in charge of all the fiddly bits downstairs. Terribly clever he is. I've got a certificate. <laughs> Uh, and here are the rest of our chaps. Uh, uh, Stoker Wadsworth. Uh, Stoker... Hang on, I can never remember their names. Oh, I do wish they wouldn't spit so. Uh, and, of course, there's Mrs. Jays, but she's probably in the kitchen creating a symphony in Halibut. Uh, and this is the boat. What do you think of her? Rose Cottage. It's a strange name for a ship. Yes, you see, I'm not over-fond of water. That's why I had her registered in Basingstoke. Uh, well, at least she floats. Well, she does, as long as you remember to keep the holes above the water line. Come on here, steady with that crater Bible! Clumsy oaf, straight into the mast. Yes, though I'm glad to see they're showing proper respect for the word of our Lord. But they might have bent it. The mast? No, it's fine. Oh, uh, do you think I could train a wisteria up it? Well, we tried a clematis, but it wouldn't take. The Rose Cottage set sail on the evening tide, or as Captain White put it, as soon as the water was deep enough. And as the further coast hove into view, I repaired to my cabin and followed our course on my gentleman's folding map. The heathen strangeness of the names cast a deep shadow to my very heart. Broadstairs, Ramsgate, Hearn Bay, an odd sort of route, but I trusted the captain's years of seafaring experience. Left here, please. Left! Left! Sorry. Port. That's it. Now right. Right, I said! Give me strength! Mind that frog! Before long, it was time for supper, to which, thanks to the captain's liberal inclinations, the whole crew was invited. Now, now, now! Don't stretch! Ask! Mr. Johnson, another piece of boiled halibut? Uh, no, no, thank you, Mrs. Jays. I've still plenty on Come my. Come on, here you are. It's brain food. Then I should give it to Stoker Wadsworth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for goodness sake, use a hanky. Tell me, Captain, do you think we should make port by the end of the week? Come again? Um, uh, how long will it take us to get there? Oh, well, that depends on Mr. Welsh's engines, doesn't it, Mr. Welsh? Well, it won't depend what? on other people. You mean there's something wrong with them? So I understand. Something to do with gaskets. Oh, oh yes, sir. The gaskets, sir. Yes, they keep blowing. Uh, and the pistons, sir. Ah, oh, definitely. Uh, we had to buy a new one. Six? Ah, uh, six new ones, yeah. And don't forget the jointage. Oh, oh yes, yeah. Nothing worse than tatty jointage, Skipper. Very expensive to put right. All right, all right. Spare me the details. Just take it out of the repair budget. Oh, uh, yeah, the repair budget. Oh, wow. And then there's the socket, sir. Keep cold. Look, you look after downstairs and I'll look after upstairs, all right? Besides, Mr. Johnson doesn't want to hear all this. On the contrary, sir, I am most anxious that our precious cargo should get through. Oh, we have to cargo. Well, since we have such a devout crew, I'm sure the Lord will watch over our voyage. Any more for any more, Mr. Johnson? Well, uh... Oh. Captain White? I, I don't think so, thank you. Has a most distinctive flavour. Well, I knew you'd like it because when I made it last Easter, you wolfed it down. Oh, so you used the same recipe? No, I used the same fish. I had a few leftovers. <laughs> well, uh, look, I, I think we'll pass on to dessert. I've done you a lovely custard marinier. Oh, that sounds unusual. Yes, it's got seven species of fish in it. <sighs> Plum brandy, anyone? Oh, oh, brandy, Mr. Johnson? Hold! Stay that cork in the devil's flagon! What? Do not partake of the juice of the vine! But it's plums. Do you not know the miserable pits of despair where to the liquid lane of alcoholism leads? It was a present from my auntie. She lives in Buxton. Ignorance, beggary, ruin, usury, filth, sweating! 
idiocy, excess of saliva, and a workhouse! Do you have any small glasses? I would remind you, Captain, that this vessel is chartered by the Mormon mission, and as its representative, it is my duty to ensure that there is no drinking on this ship! Leading, as it does, to harlotry, infanticide, shouting, strikes! All right, the bottle's going back in the cupboard. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Look, oh, surely oh, you'll, oh, you'll oh, not oh, deny oh, us a sing-song. Certainly I won't. And I shall accompany you myself on my gentleman's traveling harmonium. Wait while I unfold it. <laughs> Let's have the Turk in the captain's door. No, no! <laughs> the biggest mast in my Oh, yeah! Hey, hey, what about that one where Auntie keeps her kippers? Oh. How's it go? Uh, where, where, where Auntie keeps, keeps her kippers? kippers. There's room for plenty more. She keeps her bed and slippers. No, 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 no! When Jesus was a sailor, he ne'er would sup a drop, but bad each tar to fill his jar with wholesome ginger pop. Come, come, sing up! Captain in his cabin, a stoker in his hold, he chose his place to God's good grace and does as he is told. Fortified thus, I withdrew to my cabin with a cheery heart and quickly fell into a deep slumber. But my peace was short-lived, and for some reason I could not fathom, my guts became racked with devilish pain. The loss of my equanimity was soon followed by the loss of my supper. When I finally slept, my dreams were invaded by feverish visions. I fancied I was Jonah in the belly of the beast, but it was not, as our scripture has it, a whale, but one of Mrs. J's boiled halibut. I was spewed forth in a welter of custard marinere onto a strange shore. There was a great smoke as of a recent battle, and when it cleared I beheld a great multitude of corpses uh, littered along uh. the strand, men, women, and children. None were spared. And then I was before the gates of Nineveh, a city renowned for its size and for its sinfulness. And on the great outer wall appeared fiery letters inscribed as I fancied by the fingers of a man's hand. And this is the writing that was written. Welcome to Skegness. Oh, my head, this infernal heat. I found my watch. It was a quarter of eleven, yet outside was dark. I must have slept through the whole day. Then I realized why I had awoken. The ship had stopped. We're becalmed. But wait, this is a steamship. How queer. Hello? Ho oh, there. Hello, anyone? Mrs. Jays, Captain White, Welch, Bannister? The ship was completely deserted. I entered the mess. The table was laid for the full complement of the Rose Cottage, yet not one plate of Mrs. J's Eels Matalot had been touched. Had the crew been spirited away? Then, above the gentle lapping of the waves, I perceived a sinister banshee wail. What? Over here, on the shore. It was Captain White. He was wearing evening dress, top hat and cape. And on either arm, he had a woman as scarlet as the rose behind his left ear. Do you like it? I grew it myself. What's happened? Are we in hell? Almost. It's Clapton. Look, I, I'm not going to shout. There's a gangplank up the sharp end. Oh, oh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yes, look, just beside the sweet pea trellis. Uh-huh. Well, that's better, isn't it? Oh, he's really all ready for it, isn't he? What? <laughs> your nightshirt. Oh, no, I beg your pardon, ladies. Oh, oh, oh I haven't been 
been called that for many a year. Would you kindly explain why we've stopped? Well, it's all a bit complicated. Uh, Mr. Welsh said the engine had busted and he needed to go ashore for some spare or something. But yes. the mess, the table laid, the food untouched. Yes, Mrs. Jays gave us a supper, so we decided to go out for something to eat. <laughs> We did. Yeah, well, we should have told you, but you look so green, it would have been a shame to disturb you. Oh, yes. Oh, that reminds me. I've heard some talk about your Mr. Curtis. Yes. It seems he's taken a bit poorly, too. Yes. He's getting up to some very rum things, introducing, so they say, certain strange practices. <laughs> Shut up. But isn't he leading his flock? Well, oh, oh, yes. He's made himself mayor of Skegness. What? Yes, I, I, I gather he's become very popular with the locals. Everyone's going there. Well, this smacks of heresy. There's no time to lose. We must press on. Where's the crew? Well, they're just behind. They're a bit more, um, slow. My Havana cigar. My Havana cigar. The ladies all swoon when I bring it to town. It's long and it's thick and it crosses off a crown. The people all cheer when I wave it about. Cause it's nine inches long and four inches thick. Stop! Stop this! Stop! Stop! Yes, you stop! Stop! Captain, these men are drunk! Yes, I expect it's the alcohol. I thought I expressly forbade the consumption of liquor on board my ship. Yeah, that's why we came ashore, mate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it is his night off. Well, this is the end of it. We sail now to Skegness, and there'll be no more landings. Now get on board. And you, Mrs. Jays? That's right. Come with me, Mr. Johnson, and I'll do you a nice big helping of fickle trout. <laughs> Mr. Johnson, I do believe you've been drinking. I cannot describe the horror of the next few days, but I suppose I'd better. All manner of abominations I had to suffer. Boiled, grilled, lightly poached in dill sauce. The closeness of the heat weighed upon us heavily, and we wondered which would break first, our spirits or the weather. On the fifth day out of Zeebrugge, we had our answer. <laughs> And when you've sorted all that out, I'll put the kettle on. Look out, Captain! The mast! Oh, 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 well, bang go my plans for the wisteria. Cabin! Cabin! We ship in water. Something terrible in the engine room. I told you to keep those holes above sea level. <sighs> we could do. We're losing some ballast, sir. Oh, well, we haven't really got anything to lose. What about them great sacks of compost, sir? No, we couldn't do that. Uh, is there anything I can do to help, Captain? No, 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 not just now. We're a bit tied up with... Mr. Johnson, you know those Bibles? Yes. You need all of them? No, sir, not the Bibles. Shush. You see, if we don't chuck them over the side, we're all going to die. No, Captain. We must preserve the word of the Lord at all costs. No, no, no. I must agree with the Captain. If there be sacrifices, better ink and paper than flesh and blood. Oh, no, 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 no. Come on. Get your skates on and we'll be going down with them. Right. I've got the first crate rigged up now. All the way, Mr. Johnson. Aye, aye, Captain. Oh, hey, take your hands from that winch, sir. That's right. What's the meaning of this? They're my Bibles. I'll do as I please with them. Aye, and it will please you to leave them in the old. Go to your posts! Go to your posts, I say, or I'll have you licking the deck with your tongue! You'll make a marvellous captive! Stand aside, Johnson, unless you want this marlin spike in your vitals. Never! Get him, lads! You fool! No wind! What? Those aren't Bibles! Looks like the cat's out of the crate. Bottles of French brandy. Come on, lads. Don't let it run to waste. Oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. you're right. Uh, 
What's going on up here? See for yourself! Oh, you've got them licking the deck then? The rest of the ballast was quickly disposed of. And as the ship made its unsteady course along the dark coast, I found out that the crew, hearing of a great demand for liquor in Skegness, had substituted brandy for Bibles back in Zeebrugge. So much for the repair budget. Skegness. My mind swam with questions. What manner of flesh pot was this that rivaled Babylon in its worst excesses? What tower of Babel was Curtis raising against the Almighty? Would they make me eat fish? We were soon to find out. Good morning, Mr. Johnson. Cup of tea? Oh, <clears throat> thank you. How are the crew? Oh, they're still sleeping off the incident. For three days? Yes. But, but who needs a crew when you're working wonders with the stoking? Thank you. I'll give you a hand myself, but I'm a martyr to my blister. Oh, by the way, we've arrived. What? Yes, two hours ago. I'd have told you, but it seemed a shame to interrupt your shoving. Oh. Look, uh, uh, come up and have a look. What's that sound? What are they building? Well, we'll see soon enough when the mist clears. Well, I can't wait for that. I'm going to row ashore. Oh, you are brave. It's all in the service of the Lord. I was thinking of your poor hands. By the time I set foot on the shore, the sun had broken through the mist. And then, looking over to the left, I beheld in the distance a terrifying sight. The beach strewn with men, women, and children. The bodies in my dream. I ran, I'm ashamed to say, as if the devil were at my heels, little suspecting that he was ahead of me. I hope, Mr. Johnson, remember me? It was a diabolic civic procession. And there, at its head was the familiar face of the great Curtis, born on a popish litter, a chain of office about his neck and a town crier at each corner, accompanied by all manner of brazen instruments. Did you get the hooch? What? You know, Welch and Bannister, did they bring the art stuff? The liquor, sir, has been destroyed. Oh, well, no matter. It's no use to me. You got a diggy constitution, you see. Have to watch what I have. It seems to have affected your voice, too. Oh, the action. Well, you try your best to fit in. But what is the meaning of this horror? The horror? The horror? Yes, the bodies on the beach. Oh, they're just people sunbathing. It's quite good on, you know. But up onto the stretcher and I'll tell you more. Not another one. With reflected sunlight from his chain of office dancing round his face like fire, Curtis explained his schemes. He planned to turn Skegness into what he called a holiday resort, much like the old English spas, but appealing to a different class of folk, a haven of licentiousness, where they were encouraged to squander their earnings on drink, sweetmeats, and deck chairs, the very antithesis of thrift, hard work, and obedience. But worse was to come. And here she is, our pride and joy. Pride? Well, what do you think? You're building a Tower of Babel. But sideways? It's a pier, you daft apron. <laughs> what? We'll have all sorts of amusements on it. A penny arcade. Avarice. What the butler saw next. Plust. And a grand hall of mirrors. Vanity. Curtis, think of your mission. Think of your vows. Think of the money. Oh, yes, we're going to rake in a thousand quid a week from this. Huh. It's what I've been trained for. Persuasion. Same as you. Any road, I'm off to have a nap now, then have me tea. See you and your friends at the pier for the grand opening ceremony tomorrow morning. Ten o'clock sharp. Take it away, lads. That night I lay awake, wrestling with my soul. Should a man misuse his God-given talents in such a way? Yet if these talents were a gift from God, was it not right and proper they should be used to the brim of their capacity? The next morning, we waited by the pier. All were present, 
Captain White, Welch, Bannister, Mrs. Jays, and a sizable crowd. But of the central figure in today's ritual, there was no sign. I say, I don't think much of your Mr. Curtis's timekeeping. He may be the devil incarnate, but keeping guests waiting is downright rude. An hour and a half we waited. Then just as the band was starting on the dashing white sergeant, for the 17th time, the lone figure of a town crier came racing up the pier. Mr. Mr. Curtis. Yes, what's happened? Mr. Curtis, he, he dead. It was true. Mr. Curtis had died that morning after a night racked with fever and pain. A mysterious gift of boiled halibut from a well-wisher had proved too much for what he called his dicky constitution. But, 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 I mean, well, who could have perpetrated such a vile deed? Well, Skegness is now a thriving seaside resort, fun for all the family, safe bathing, miles of sandy beaches. It's so bracing. And, of course, special reductions for Mausoleum Club members. Uh, well, what a road to Damascus that was. Now, tell me, how is it that you now heap extravagant praise on a resort you're only now describing in terms that would make Sodom and Gomorrah blanch with modesty? Well, Mr. Green, I suppose it's civic pride. You've got to stick up for your hometown, especially when you're the mayor. Any road, we'll sketch my train. I'll leave you some brochures. Some what? <laughs> Tales from the Mausoleum Club, Episode 2, Heart of Skegness, was written by Ian Brown and James Hendry and starred Matt Frewer, Jim Broadbent, Richard Pearson, Royce Mills, Sheila Stiefel, Bill Wallace, Ron Pember and Michael Ripper. Music was by Max Harris. The producer was Paul Spencer. The Horror. The Horror? That programme was first heard in 1987 and Fulton Mackay stars in next week's episode called A Study in Starlets. The Moth Radio Hour. Sunday mornings at 11 and again in the evening at 7 on BBC Radio 4 Extra. So I'm sure a lot of you think that your dads make dating worse than the intrinsic nightmare that it already is. Um, but y'all didn't grow up in Texas, <laughs> okay? My dad is a couple inches taller than I am, but probably one of the most intimidating men on the planet. He's an ex-Air Force Vietnam vet who became a mechanic because he was much better with his hands than he was with his heart. <laughs> He's allergic to feelings. So my dad started running romantic interference very early in my life. I remember a night when I was five or six and we were having dinner at the closeted gay music minister's house. And uh, I was down the hall playing with his son and we were playing kiss tag, which I'm sure you can imagine is tag with kissing. As soon as my dad found out, he came to the back room, he grabbed me by my ear and drug me onto the hallway and said, you ain't never to play that game again. And I said, why, Dad? He said, because kissing is where babies come from. <laughs> okay. I have brought literally two humans home to meet my father. The first one might as well not have had a name because he was only ever referred to as noodle arms. <laughs> this includes all in-person interactions. <laughs> The second one hadn't even been in our house for five minutes when my dad sat him down and handed him a grenade. <laughs> he had emptied the powder from the grenade, but of course the boy did not know that. He sat down next to him, pulled the pin, and said, I got a couple questions for you. <laughs> the Moth Radio Hour. Sunday mornings at 11, and again in the evening at 7 on BBC Radio 4 Extra. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. (laughs) 
It's nine o'clock. Susan Kalman challenges Sarah Millican, Andrew O'Neill, Ricky Wilson and Roisin Conaty in the show that loves lists next. Then in Bangers and Mash, the catering team are desperate for new orders, a new van and a bookkeeping genius.